Happy Sabbath. Good morning, good evening from wherever you're joining us from. We are so happy that you found time and even just took uh, time to share the link and welcome others to join us in the Sabbath School lesson. Sabbath School is actually the heart of the church. Uh, it is really... My grandma, my grandma says, if you miss Sabbath school, don't go to church. You've missed everything. Actually, I'm not telling you to do that. That's just her conviction. But today we are going to learn the foundation of God's government. We're still doing the book, The Great Controversy. I'm joined by my wonderful team here. And before they say their names and tell us what they'll be leading us through this study, I'll ask that Japheth, please open for us with a word of prayer. Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity that you've given us, uh, this opportunity to discuss uh, uh, these themes regarding the foundation of, of your government in heaven. Uh, as we are studying about the law and everything that connotes the law, may the Holy Spirit be our guide and that the hearers and the viewers may be blessed. We thank and praise your name, for it is in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. 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 Um, please, let's say our name starting from this side. Uh, from Wensongo, and just uh, tell us what you'll be taking us through. My name is Onsongo Rafael Nyamiso. I'll be uh, taking you through Monday, the immutability of God's law. Amen. Uh, my name is Seraphine Okemwa. I will be taking you through the mysterious, now revealed, mm. mark of the beast. Amen, amen. Praise God. My amen. name is Jastrono. I'll be studying with you the Sabbath and the law. Mm. Uh, yes, and my name is Jafetrono. I'll be taking us through the sanctuary and the law. Amen. Thank you so much. Um, I'm Rumana Pio, and I'm glad to be studying with you this lesson of the great controversy. And our key text comes from the book of Revelation, chapter 12, verse 7. I'm reading from the New King James Version, and it says, And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Brethren, we are back to Revelation, and I'm sure you might want to go back to that lesson just a bit um, to revise your notes if you, if you feel like Kunavitu uh, Mesahau. But this is an interesting title for this week, The Foundation of God's Government, and you're going to look at it from the eyes of Revelation. John the Revelator is the one who's going to talk to us. And just a reminder again that we are reading the book of the Great Controversy. Um, for context, for you to understand this lesson, you, there is no two way about it. You just have to read the book. And our chapters this week, or the focus this week, is on chapters 25 to 27. And I'll ask that just Japheth to give us a summary. Uh, thanks so much. So chapter 25, 26, and 27 talk about God's immutable law. Sabbath reform and modern revivals. Mm -hmm. uh, it actually is a description of what happened when, 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 when certain believers began to study what is going on specifically within the sanctuary, within the Ten Commandments, and, mm -hmm. why, and if the Ten Commandments still apply to us today. Mm -hmm. And as a result, chapter 27, chapter 26 um, re reviews what happened once the Sabbath truth became a reality and people understanding of what exactly happened in history. And chapter 27 tells us what happens once um, what appears like a revival is not a revival. Yeah. Once people who are claiming to be Christian try and, and, and have a revivification of Christianity, but without Christ and without the law. Yes. And the result is actually a false revival. Mm, yes. Yeah, so there can be actually a false revival. True. Yeah. Um, through intensive Bible study, the word is there is intensive Bible studies. Adventists came to understand the significance of the significance of the law in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. Remember in our last lesson we were talking about the sanctuary and we tried to and elucidate what the heavenly sanctuary is and what actually the sanctuary, what happens there and who is there. And I pray that you still remember. And another thing that they look, they understood or rather discovered is Looking into the heart of God's law, they discovered the significance of the Sabbath, the fourth commandment. In fact, this commandment, more than any other, identifies God as our creator. The fourth commandment didn't just come to happen. It started way back in Genesis. Because on the seventh day, the, the, the Lord did what? He rested and he sanctified the day and it became the Sabbath. So it is not a matter of uh, human beings coming up with the Sabbath. It is God himself who instituted the, the, 
the Sabbath. He's the one who created the Sabbath. No one did that. But we meet it as a commandment in Exodus chapter 20, and it becomes the fourth commandment. And it is one of the things that the devil fights with a lot of vigor. He fights with all his might to just bring a lot of confusion around Sabbath. So much such that at some point people say that, ah, me I'll worship on Wednesday, on whatever day they choose, not remembering that it is the Lord who instituted the Sabbath. And this week, the aim of the lesson is to show us the link between the sanctuary, God's law, the Sabbath, and the coming crisis over the mark of the beast. We'll also explore the relevance of the Sabbath to the end time generation. So really, you really need to understand. Uh, take your pen, call your friends, and let them know that we are here to know what it means to have the Sabbath and the law and its the end time crisis related to the Sabbath. And the first lesson, the sanctuary and the law, the Sunday part. Japheth is going to take us through that. Please go ahead. Thank you, Ramona. So, uh, 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 the last few sessions, we have actually been reviewing what happened as God's people began to study the scriptures. They studied Daniel 8, 14. Mm. They saw that uh, unto 2,300 days then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Mm. At that time, a belief was the sanctuary was the earth. And so, there was a belief that once the sanctuary is cleansed, the earth is cleansed. Jesus Christ is coming. People honestly felt that Christ is coming at a particular time that was calculated. 1844 but it never happened mm. a disappointment and then the believers went back into the scriptures and when they went back in the scriptures mm. they found all oh, the sanctuaries actually in heaven, yes. that the sanctuary on earth in Exodus 25 was a replica of the sanctuary in heaven. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1 to 5, uh, and we actually given a description of everything that was earthly was just like a small version, a miniature of the great, magnificent, and glorious representation of the true one, which is in heaven. And that's precisely what we find with regarding uh, a, a, a one article in the sanctuary, the Ark of the Covenant, and what was inside the Ark of the Covenant, the Ten Commandments. When you read from Revelation chapter 11, verse 19, we find that the temple of God was opened in heaven and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. That means in heaven, as the temple was opened in heaven, there was an ark of a covenant that was opened. And, in, and, and, and because we saw, especially from last week, that everything on earth was a replica of everything in heaven. In Exodus chapter 25, verse 16, a uh, uh, when God is giving Moses a description of all the articles that are found in the sanctuary, we are told that you shall put uh, into the ark of the... Uh, uh, um, the testimony, uh, what that God shall give, which were the Ten Commandments. So the Ten Commandments were placed inside the Ark of the Covenant. Mm -hmm. In fact, and the, and the Ten Commandments themselves were actually written with the very finger of oh God. My. Exodus chapter 31 verse 18 we are told that God gave to Moses um, when he had made an end of communion with him upon Mount Sinai two tablets or two tables of the testimony, tablets of stone written with the very finger of God. Mm. So picture this we have a sanctuary in heaven mm. in the sanctuary in heaven we have the ark of the, the covenant, covenant the ark of the testimony. Mm. Within the ark of the testimony just as it was on earth so also in heaven we have the same Ten Commandments. Mm. And these same Ten Commandments were written with the finger of God. Mm. And this law of God, the Ten Commandments, are not a minor issue. In the book of Revelation chapter 12 verse 17, we actually find that the, the Ten Commandments are, are, are key targets of the enemy that God's people are, are um, uh, uh, particularly because God's people are actually following them. Revelation chapter 12 verse 17 we are told the dragon, Satan himself, was angry with the woman, the church, and went to wake war with the remnant of her seed which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So that same uh, 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 Ten Commandments which are found in the Ark of the Covenant in heaven, God's people keeping it was enraging the devil himself. Mm -hmm. And even this very day that same war continued. So as God's people in 1844 were studying the scriptures and as they were studying the sanctuary, there was a special revelation that came to them that this had been forgotten. The Ten Commandments had actually been forgotten. Mm -hmm. In fact, during that particular time and for very many years there were two commandments that had largely been obscured. Mm. The second commandment in the book of, uh, of Exodus 20 tells us that you shall not make any in graven image. images. Mm. And we actually do find in unfortunately many churches 
many such images and people bowing down to them. In fact, some of those uh, images are worshipped so often that parts of them have actually begun to peel off mm -hmm. because they have been touched by people mm -hmm. trying to receive mm -hmm. some kind of blessing mm -hmm. um, from those particular statues. Mm -hmm. And the, and, and, uh, the commandment number four we'll actually review um, uh, 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 also was obscured. So when God's people, when they began to study the Ark of the Covenant and everything that connotes the uh, the most holy place, they came to a special realization that God's people should actually be keeping the, all of God's Ten Commandments. And that special uh, revelation was not something that was theirs. It was actually a gift that came mm -hmm. from God. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and in that, they actually came to appreciate not what you think. You know, sometimes when you think God's Ten Commandments, you think it's just judgment. No. Mm -hmm. It's actually a merger of mercy and judgment. That once we appreciate that God's law is there for us, we understand that Jesus Christ is ready to give us the power to overcome and to keep God's law. So even the, the, the keeping of the commandments itself is an invitation to have a closer walk with Jesus Christ. Amen. Yeah. Amen. And the lesson writers insist and say that um, the Ark of the Covenant was in the heavenly sanctuary. It means that certainly it could not have been done away with at the cross. True. Yeah, so it is still there. And when we get to heaven, I'm sure we'll see even the Ten Commandments. Yeah, th yeah. Uh, thank you. In fact, in fact, in the in, in all of the New Testament, several times mm. we find condemnations about adultery, yes. about lying, mm. murder, mm. about even Sabbath keeping, exactly. about uh, idolatry, having mm. one God. So clearly, even in the New Testament, mm. the time of Jesus, the time mm. of apostles, mm. those Ten Commandments were still being kept, upheld, sustained, mm. because they could never be done away with. Yes, yes. Thank you so much, Japheth, for that. Um, we move to Monday, the immutability of God's law. Uh, Zafeth. Indeed, uh, Monday speaks to us about the immutability of God's law or the, the everlasting aspect uh, that you cannot really say that God's law has been removed. It's no longer relevant. It's no longer important. Mm. But uh, if we look to look at Christendom today, we find that there are movements, there are people who teach that uh, God's law has been changed. But Scripture tells us that God's law can never be changed. We read from Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 and verse 18, Christ says, heaven and earth will pass away first, you mm. see. Uh, cathedrals, churches, movements that uh, propagate this type of teaching, Christ says those things will pass away first mm -hmm. before even one jot or one tittle of the law uh, is, able, is able to be changed. He said also Christ himself coming and saying, he says in that text, he says, I came not to do away with the law, mm. but rather to fulfill it, yes. to fulfill it. Mm. Um, reading from uh, Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 13 and 14, we see, um, we see Solomon as he's, uh, as he's finishing that wonderful book where he gives um, advice on how to live life. He reads, he reads from verse 13 and he says, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment, every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. That the whole duty of man is to do what? Fear God. To, fear to fear God, God fear and to God. keep his commandments. Yeah. Almost similar language to what we read in the three angels' messages. Fear God and give him glory. Mm. Uh, it is directly tied with keeping his commandments. First John chapter 5 and verse 3, John writing and says, For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not what? grievous. Mm. His commandments are not heavy. Yeah. They are not painful. Mm. They are actually, the commandments of God can be divided into two. Christ was asked by a lawyer uh, what is the greatest, uh, what are the, how can, what is the commandment, you know? Which is the greatest uh, The greatest, and he, said, he told them the greatest commandment is, 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 is this, that you love the Lord your God mm. with everything. Mm. You? Your whole soul, your being, and everything. And then the second one is just like unto it, that you love your neighbor as, yes. as yourself. Yes. And if you look at the Ten Commandments, uh, which some people would like us to assume are ten suggestions, mm. but no, they are not. They are ten commandments and, and, and they are eternal and they are not grievous. You find the first four are in relation with us and how we relate God. with God. Mm -hmm. And then from commandment number five to ten are in terms of how we can live peaceably with, uh, with the approval of God mm -hmm. and also with the other men mm -hmm. and, and with mankind. And so we see these commandments have, are under our onslaught. And when the, when the reformers and patriarchs and these men of old were being led to study scripture and they were thinking about the cleansing of the sanctuary, lo and behold, they entered into the most holy place. And what they see as one of the central pieces in the most holy place, 
the Ark of the Covenant. Mm. And inside the Ark of the Covenant, as we saw in Revelation chapter 11 and verse 19, they found the most glorious um, testament, even the commandments of God. Mm. And so, Proverbs chapter 28 and verse 9, he says, He that turneth away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be an abomination. Bible speaks to us and tells us that if we disregard God's law, if we disregard the thing uh, that describes to us who God is, because a nation is known by its laws, you know, uh, if you look at the laws of this country, it can tell you what type of people uh, are, in, are, are, in it, are in its borders. And if you look at God's commandments, God's ten commandments, they tell us what, what, what type of person he is, his character, his government, and what type of environment he would like to have around him. And so, to suggest that the commandments have been done away with, to misconstrue and uh, to, to, to wrestle scripture to say something other than what it means, then is not to do justice, but rather sure. is to change religion, to make God after our own image. Whereas God has made us into his image and he, he expects us to respond to the way in which he has made us. Romans chapter 7 verse 11 and verse 12. Paul writing about the law, he says, For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me and it slew me. Wherefore, wherefore the law is what? Holy. And the commandment holy and just and good. Mm. David writing wonderfully in Psalms 89 and verse 14 says, Justice and judgment are the habitation of thy throne. Mercy and truth shall go before thy face. In, another, in Psalm 119, which is an interesting psalm, which I think we all ought to read, where he, David simply waxes lyrical about the law of God mm -hmm. and how precious and how pure and how, how loaded it is uh, as, as a treasure. He says in 142, he says, Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and thy law is truth. In John 17, verse 17, he says, Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. In Psalms 119 and verse 172, he says, My tongue shall speak of thy word, and all thy commandments are righteous. And so we see the law of God is as unchanging as, as God himself. Mm. And so to find people and movements that teach us that, that the moral law of God has been changed. Because the, the moral law of God is in relation to his, um, to his very character. You know, that God can change and, uh, and, and, and that one, that the Sabbath is no longer important and, uh, and that uh, we can now worship through, media, through mediums and through idols. It's not, it's not true and it's not proper. God says, I am the Lord your God, I change not. Mm. Christ is the same yesterday, today and, yes. forever. and forever. And those things are entrenched in scripture. And similarly, he who is the word, because in the beginning was the word, mm. and Christ is the word, and he says he's not unchanging. Then similarly, his law is as unchanging as he himself. Amen. Amen. Powerful. God will not change because we are in 2023 or in 2030 or in 2045 if we live up to those years. And then because uh, technology is evolving every day or, you know, things are, we are moving, we are living in a new dispensation. The law of the Lord stays as it is. And Zapheth has told us it was written by the finger of God himself. And Onsongo has told us that these people that come and say, you know what, we don't need the Sabbath anymore. A movement comes and he's saying, we don't need to do this, we don't need to do this. They don't even last. But the law of the Lord stays forever. forever. And even Amen. as you read from the book of Isaiah the other time. And now we move to the law. The Sabbath and the law will be led by this. And I'll read for us the book of Genesis chapter 1, chapter 2, verse 1 to 3. And it says, Thus the heavens and the earth, all the host of them were finished. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. Just when this verse is written, we are not even, we don't even know if the Israelites will come. You know, it is written in Genesis chapter 2 verse 1 to 3. And as you speak to us about the Sabbath and the law, I'd like you to Tell us uh, what of your opinion of the fourth commandment and the fact that it was inexistent before even the Ten Commandments. Yeah, I think it's just a reminder that 
we are studying the great controversy. Yes. Mm. <laughs> I think I'll keep saying that mm. over and over again that it's the controversy between God mm. and Satan. Mm. And actually something that I came across and um learned recently um Exodus chapter 14 which I mean Isaiah chapter 14 which is um what we have revi- we reviewed at the beginning that this controversy began in heaven mm. with Satan desiring to claim that the law of God cannot be kept. Exactly. Um mm. Isaiah chapter 14 speaking of Lucifer mm. We are told that how art thou fallen, I'm reading verse 12 from the King James Version. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. That it has been um, Satan's intention all along to take the worship that is due to God. And what is interesting, I came across in verse 13. The word congregation, therefore thou hast said in thy heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation. That the word congregation there uh, actually means, it is, the original word is moed, which means the times, the seasons, that he will seek Satan's intention to actually seek to make people not to worship on the true seasons that the God has appointed. The appointed times that God has set was all the way from the beginning when he was in heaven. He desired to actually make a change. And so as my brothers have reviewed and shown that the law of God is immutable. The question that people ask, okay, fine, maybe the whole law is immutable. It is immutable and nothing can be changed about the law of God. But what about the Sabbath? What about the Sabbath. Mm. Um, do, should we still keep the Sabbath? Mm. And it's interesting what you have pointed out that the Sabbath commandment existed even before um, Exodus chapter 20. Mm. Existed even before. And actually, uh, it is not just the Sabbath commandment alone that existed. We know that all the commandments of God existed before Exodus chapter 20. That Exodus chapter 20, God is just only proclaiming them in a certain way to the Jews, to the children of Israel. Mm. but they already existed actually before exodus chapter 20 we see god taking the children of israel from egypt and when moses goes to um pharaoh he tells pharaoh i need you to release the children of um, israel why because i need them to go and rest this is way before Exodus chapter 20. He needed them to go and observe the Sabbath. Then after they walk through the wilderness for a while, we see Moses, um, I, I mean, we see, we, we, we see God giving them instructions about um, collecting manna. And he says, you need to collect it every, uh, for six days. Mm-hmm. But on the seventh day, you will not collect it because you, you, you're not, you'll not collect it because you're going to rest. Before even Exodus 20, the Sabbath commandment already existed. And why was it given to us? The book of of um, Ezekiel chapter 20 um, verse 12 tells us um, actually let me start with verse 20 tells us that hallow my Sabbath that and they shall be aside between me and you so that you can do what so that you can know that I am the Lord your God to help us identify who God is to show us the sign of who our God is it is because of the Sabbath and that's why he rests after his creation work and when the Sabbath commandment is given to us the Bible says remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy and then it goes back to reference the work of creation tells us it is God who created the heavens and the earth Mm. and on the seventh he rested it is the sabbath that reminds us who is the creator and then secondly um the book of ezekiel chapter 20 verse 12 self gives us another reason for the sabbath says moreover also i gave them my sabbath to be a sign between me and them that they may do what that they may know that i am the lord that doth sanctify them that it is not only a sign of our creation Mm -hmm. it is it is also a sign of our redemption it is the sign that shows us that god is still sanctifying us Mm -hmm. and you know people in um 
may criticize seven day adventists and say why are you keeping the sabbath mm. it is the sabbath of the jews mm. the question i would ask them has god stopped sanctifying mm. his people yeah. you did god only sanctify the jews and mm. he's not sanctifying us today mm. it is our sign of sanctification Amen. and we are told in hebrews chapter 4 that there remains a rest for the children of god Amen. for us to enter into that rest and what we do find in that rest when we enter into that rest we not only rest from our labors um, our physical labors we rest from our labors of sin mm. it reminds us that there is grace that there is work that christ has done for us that we cannot do for ourselves and therefore let us enter into that rest that he gives us and many people may criticize us for um keeping the sabbath but they are denying themselves them uh, a great blessing a great sign that god has given to his children to enable them to rest from all the works works of righteousness that cannot save them and only enter into the righteousness that only God can give. Amen. The Sabbath is indeed a great blessing and it remains, it abides in those ten commandments. The ones in heaven, the Sabbath commandment is still there. It is still found within Amen. that law. Amen. It has not been changed. Amen. Just, there is this question that I know you've battled it or some other person is battling it right now because of work or school or any other thing, family, friends. And we are always told that you are being legalistic by keeping the Sabbath. You know, how, what would you tell that person? Like, sometimes you even lack the response to say, because you are told you're being very legalistic. I remember there's a time we, uh, we were having this conversation in a group of people that were not Seventh-day Adventists, and someone asked innocently, when is the Sabbath? And then I said Saturday because that is what I've known. That is what the Bible has proved to me. And then another person said that, you know, Seventh-day Adventists are legalistic. That thing keeps creeping up every other time. What would be your reply? You know, you can only be legalistic if you're keeping the sabbath to save yourself yes. but if you're keeping the sabbath because god has commanded mm -hmm. it and it is your desire to please the lord and honor him you are not being legalistic you are entering into that which he has invited Amen. you to enter Amen. into so actually i would say someone who is uh, um, not keeping the sabbath um usually it began you by the time you you be, if you're being legalistic it you, you will end up actually not giving keeping it eventually just mm -hmm. like the rest of the people mm -hmm. but anyone who is not legalistic desires the salvation that god gives is only obeying the command you know people would say why are you celebrating your wife's anniversary mm. on this particular day or on that particular day you're mm. being legalistic mm. try and change it on another day and you'll see how your wife will respond and say just keep it on another day mm. are you being legalistic no, no. you're just entering into a memorial that brings the both of you joy and peace to remember what has been and what uh, what what is prepared for you in years to come mm. some of you just try and change your wedding anniversary <laughs> and you'll see <laughs> yes yeah, I need mm -hmm. to add um, mm -hmm. that uh, it's uh, even if if the label of legalism is being thrown at us, yes. we cannot we can we can remove that label and say we are being loyalist. Amen. This these charges against the fourth commandment mm -hmm. are never raised against any other one of mm -hmm. the other commandments. When when like let's say when you are called, let's say God forbid, to engage in corruption at work, it is not legalism to say no. Mm -hmm. When you're being uh, tempted to commit adultery, mm -hmm. it is not legalism to say no. It is loyalism. It's saying that God has commanded, mm -hmm. and I will act in a way that glorifies God. Yeah. yeah. And you know when Exodus is written in chapter uh, the fourth commandment starts remember the Sabbath day to do what? To keep it holy. Mm -hmm. yes. And it is not like any it, it's when I read that commandment this when I was preparing for this then I'm like oh actually, actually it's not like God is starting afresh with you. He's just telling you what remember what I said in Genesis chapter 2. Remember to keep it holy. Uh, one of the uh, hardest thing I've, ever, I've had to contest with recently is uh, having to defend Sabbath uh, from someone who actually understands Sabbath. Sometimes we become our own persecu thinking, persecutors. Yeah. You know, you are persecuting someone because they have decided to stand up for Sabbath and you you have decided that ah, I can work on Sabbath, I can do things on Sabbath, and that is the hardest thing. And I'm asking you as a Seventh-day Adventist, as a loyalist, as you've been told, 
are you keeping the Sabbath and also allowing others to keep the Sabbath? Because as you read the commandment, it says, and I know it's on this very panel that we say that even the servants and the people who are visiting your house should do what? Keep the Sabbath day holy. Are you allowing them? Or because you have compromised, you also want others to do what? Follow suit with you. We now move to the most interesting part of this lesson, the mark of the best. And I know all of us will have comments on that. So, Seraphine, please take the lead as even as we take comments from the panel. Thank you very much. You want to ask yourself, why is the mark of the beast important? Mm. It is because there is war that has been declared over anybody who received it, receives it. In the book of Revelation, chapter 14, verse 9, the Bible says, Then a third angel followed him, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Sad. Mm -hmm. And for that reason, it becomes a concern because God has told us not to take that mark. I will start with saying what it is not. One, it is not a physical mark, meaning we cannot see it. M meaning there are people who say, you know, it is a chip on your hand. No, 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 no. Is it a card? No, 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 no. Is it a number on somebody's forehead? No, no, no. It is not a physical mark. It is a spiritual mark. So the question we want to ask ourselves is, what is this mark? It has to be something to do with working against the law of God. Mm -hmm. And it has to do with the commandments of God. When you read in the book of Revelation, chapter 12, the mark of the beast. In the book of Revelation, chapter 12, I will read verse 17. It says, And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring, who keep the commandments of God and who have the testimony of Jesus Christ. God has wrath against those who partake of the mark. But the devil has wrath against those who keep God's commandment. The mark of the beast is against the law of God. And what is at the center of the law of God? Mm. It is actually his Sabbath. Mm -hmm. It is actually the fourth commandment which highlights the Sabbath of the Lord. I would encourage you to read this book. I may not go deep into the discussions around the mark of the beast, but when you read this book in a chapter called The Final Warning, chapter 38, it will highlight more about the same. The mark of the beast is Sunday sacredness. Mm. And the question we want to ask ourselves is, is it already the mark of the beast? The answer is no. Why? Because God is a fair God. God is a holy God. None is made to suffer the wrath of God until the truth has been brought home to his mind and conscience and has been rejected. There are many who have never had an opportunity to hear the special truth of this time. The obligation of the fourth commandment has never been set before them in its true light. He who reads Every heart and tries every motive will leave none who desire a knowledge of truth to be deceived as to the issues, rather issues, sorry, of the controversy. The decree is not to be urged upon the people blindly. Everyone is to have sufficient light to make this decision intelligently. Therefore, the mark of the beast is Sunday sacredness, and it is not the mark yet because the decree has not gone forth until everybody has gotten an opportunity to hear the word of God and then having had still disregards the law, then it will become the mark of the beast. Now, how is it received? It is either received on the forehead or on the right arm. And the forehead is, actually it being received on the forehead represents 
you actually having been convinced to not only receive it, but to follow it with your conscience, with your being, you follow it having been convinced in your conscience. Mm -hmm. Now, the second part where it is received is your arm. We are told in the book of Revelation, chapter 13, verse 17, I will start from verse 16. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand and on their forehead, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. When you receive the mark of the beast on your hand, it is you through your actions having confirmed or having hailed Sunday sacredness. You know, because you think, oh, if I do not work on, on this Sabbath day, look, I will not eat. I will not put food on the table. I will not be closed. I will not meet my bills. And therefore you proceed to work through your conduct. And most of the Seventh-day Adventists will receive this mark on their hands because having been baptized, you are convinced in your mind that indeed the Sabbath is the true day of rest. But because of the demands of life, the pressures of life and the economy, you decide, you know what, I will violate it so that I can afford the conveniences of life. And then you receive it on your right hand, through your conduct, through your actions. And friends, I want to encourage us that it is not an easy road, but God is on our side. Mm -hmm. It is not easy, having received this message, to accept it, but God is on your right hand to help you. If you are willing, if you are desirous to live up to his commandments and up to his will. And uh, finally, as I close, I would like to urge that the devil will have wrath on you. Mm -hmm. And why is this wrath uh, on you, my brother and my sister, who chooses to keep the law of God? Allow me to read something in a periodical called Review and Herald, April 27, 1911. She says, a refusal to obey the commandments of God and a determination to cherish hatred against those who proclaim these commandments leads to the most determined war on the part of the dragon. Those whose whole energies are brought to bear against the commandment keeping people of God. He causes all, both small and great, to receive a mark in their right hand and in their forehead. Not only a man not to work with their hands on Sunday, but with their minds they are to acknowledge Sunday as the Sabbath. And that no man might buy or sell, save he that has the mark and the name of the beast or the number of his name. When you begin to keep the Sabbath, you will experience difficulties mm. and challenges. Mm. But these are those that come to elevate you, to glorify the character of God in your life. Indeed, he chooses his children in the furnace of affliction. Yeah. Amen. Thank you so much, Seraphine. Before we give comments, I'd love us to go to the three angels message so that once we are done, then we can give our comments on the mark of the beast and the three angels messages. Uh, starting with you, Jaffe, the three angels messages. We were with you on this panel when you were talking about it. That's true. So yeah, please go ahead. Uh, great, thank you. Yes, so we actually did a whole uh, 13 week session exactly. of the Three Angels Messages. Mm. It was very in depth. Mm. And I encourage, I believe, there are even records mm. uh, online. You can just go and review them. Mm. So, so in a very um, quick span, we'll actually see that the Three Angels Messages are, are kind of a, a reinforcement of what we've been talking about. Mm. That the law of God is, is, is an essential part of God's government mm. and that God is proclaiming claiming that his people rise up to something that they have been forgotten. In fact, you, t you said that remember. Mm. Remember, you said remember mm. the Sabbath, Sabbath day, day. Uh, uh, Exodus 20. This is actually what the, especially the first angel is about. Mm. We, we read here, um, the three angels messages are found in Revelation chapter 14 mm. verse 6 to 12. But the first angel's message says, I saw 
Revelation 14 verse 6, I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to them to dwell on all the earth, to dwell on the earth, and to, and to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Already, just to pause, mm -hmm. how marvelous it is that God's message, this message that we can tell from the timing, mm -hmm. is actually the last message, mm -hmm. is actually an all-encompassing mm -hmm. message to mm -hmm. all of God's people, mm -hmm. everywhere, of every skin color, or every um, uh, background. Saying with a loud voice, fear God and give, give glory him to him planet. for the hour of his judgment is come. Planet. That it is true that, it, that, that in all times we are to fear God and give him glory. But there is a special, there's a special like call specifically because of what we discussed here and in the previous session when we talked about the fact that the hour of God's judgment mm -hmm. is present. Mm -hmm. That right now we are living in the anti-typical day of atonement, especially so. It is time for us to fear God and give him glory and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of water. That, that statement, um, uh, 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 we can tell, is actually lifted from the fourth commandment. It is actually a special reference to God um, uh, calling us to keep this... Uh, 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 to, to keep the law, the Ten Commandments, and especially the Sabbath commandment. God calls upon us today to fear God, to give glory to him, to keep his law, especially, um, I know Seraphim has told us, even when it is difficult, even when the Ten Commandments um, are, 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 are not favorable. We know that we live in a country, unfortunately, that is corrupt. Sometimes you may be called to steal the money that doesn't belong to us. Mm. We are called sometimes um, and, and, and tempted to break the Sixth Commandment, mm. the Fifth, um, the fo and, and, and even the fourth here but God calls us to stand up and to stand firm and then once that happens then we ourselves may be witnessing what happens under the second um, angel's message we are told Babylon is fallen Amen. in fallen mm. that great city because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of our fornication mm. once God has called us to righteousness and to keep his law then unfortunately there is a separation is a separation and 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 god's people must start coming out of the babylonian systems mm. because unfortunately much as it is wonderful for us to have communion with all the people so unfortunately once standards and principles are at stake we must stand firm for truth than for anything else and at that point we must come out of the fallen systems the fallen systems that do not keep god's law mm -hmm. and stand firm even and some, sometimes alone sometimes in small groups but stand firm for the truth amen amen mm -hmm. i'll jump right to Nsongo. uh your comments on the three angels messages i think uh what we're trying simply to say is there is safety you may you may not even maybe you may miss out on the on the on the matters here that are that are big, but I'd like to summarize it in the in that the spirit of the of of the gospel is obedience, mm. uh, full obedience to Amen. the commands of God, mm. to what to how God has revealed Himself to us. The heart of the great controversy is also uh, to a certain extent about the character of God, and um, and does God is God really worthy of worship? Mm. And if so, then how should we worship Him? Mm. You know, has God put in, structure, in place structures and ways in which you're supposed to worship? If we, we even to consider the attack on the fourth commandment, which is the commandment on the Sabbath, which as you've seen is a commandment which if you keep, you are labeled a legalist. If you are honoring your parents, you know, you're trying to do your best, nobody will tell you you're a legalist. You see, if you don't steal, you know, perhaps then you should steal for us not to be legalists, you know, <laughs> and things like that, or cheat on our wives or on our significant others, etc., uh, etc. Et mm -hmm. But you see, there is a, there's, an, uh, there's an active attack on the Sabbath day. And so, but if you look at the Sabbath, and the Sabbath in and of itself is a commandment in which we, uh, we identify who it is that is giving the Ten Commandments, of all the commandments. He speaks and says, I am the Lord who brought you out of, out of the land of Egypt. I'm the one who made the earth in six days, and, 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 and this and that, and this and that. And God identifies himself, and it answers even the questions that we have as human beings today, such as uh, it, it Dis, dis, dismisses atheism completely. He tells us that this world was made by God, mm. and this God has has, has a structure and is a way in which he's, he's put mm. he's put his things, and he wishes for us to rest on the seventh day, not for any scientific reason or anything, but simply in obedience, because in six days he made the heaven and the earth and all the all that in them is, but on the seventh day he rested, and he says uh, he's coming again soon, even after we fell into sin. He sent his only begotten son, Christ, dies on the cross, resurrects, goes into heaven, 
our wonderful high priest doing the work of intercession. And he tells us that the judgment is coming. And in this judgment, then, the question is, the standard by which we are judged is God's law. Mm. And the devil wants to lie to us. The devil wants to sway us away from God's law. And anything, you would, I would say, anything that drives us away from God's law will inadvertently lead us to receiving the mark mm. of the beast. Mm. Though we have understood what the mark of the beast is, uh, in that uh, it is uh, through human institutions, the devil using instrumentalities to create a false Sabbath, a false narrative, a false God, to, um, and, and a whole system that draws people. And even if you look, if you look at the history, as you, as you refer to that uh, study on the three angels' messages, we realize that these people actually say that this is the mark of their ecclesiastical authority and of their presence, that they were able to change God's Sabbath from the seventh-day Sabbath and transfer it to the first day of the week. Mm -hmm. And so the question to us today is whom, to whom, whom will you worship? Whom will you worship? You know, will you receive the mark of God's, uh, of God's people, of his sanctification as just told us? Or will we men uh, follow after the, the machinations of men the way our fathers and our forefathers in their ignorance sometimes or in their rebellion worshipped? The question is how shall we stand in that great day? Amen. How shall we stand in that great day? Just we come back to you. The three angels' messages. I'm actually glad that they finished this lesson with the three angels' messages mm -hmm. at the mm -hmm. very end mm -hmm. when we are speaking about God's mm -hmm. law. Because the attack, this great controversy is not about anything else but about worship. Yes. And if the devil is attacking God's law, I don't think his, his greatest deception is on the second part of the Decalogue of um, 5 to 10. The, the world generally agrees we should not kill, we should not commit mm. adultery. The biggest question is on the first part of the Decalogue. <laughs> and that's why the three angels' messages are given. Why? Because the devil is questioning whom should we worship. Mm -hmm. The first angel's message declares who that is, the one who is the creator. Mm. And then we, um, I, again, and that's almost like, the, the first commandment, you know, honor the Lord, the God, only him, only worship, only God, you know, no other God. Then secondly, the second commandment telling us about not to have any graven images. That's what the three angels messages are covering that we should, there should be, there is going to be an image to the beast and people are going to receive the mark of that. The, the, the very mark of the beast tells us it's about that. The third angels, uh, the third commandment speaking about, again, the devil is attacking the commandments of God mm -hmm. that we should not take the name of God like we are told in the third angel's message we should not take the, the name of the beast mm -hmm. and then the fourth commandment which is honoring the Sabbath and we are now discuss the mark of the beast mm -hmm direct attack at the law of God mm. and God gives us the final warning in the three angels messages and these three messages they are steps if you fail to keep the first you will definitely fail to keep the second if you don't uphold the standards of God in his law you will not accept that the baby, that the world is fallen around you mm. and if you fail to keep the second because you've not accepted that you will be prepared to receive the mark of the beast but what is the hope we are given in the third angels message we are told that even when the whole world has fallen, mm. even when Babylon is fallen, in this world there is going to be found a people who will have their faith anchored on Christ alone. And their faith, we are told in Revelation 14, 12, that it will be the faith of Jesus. That faith that is unshaken, that faith that trusts in God, even when all around seems like there is a great controversy, there is a war waging, and people want to kill them, people want to persecute them, they will not have that that faith that goes through the darkness, mm. that faith that looks beyond the veil and finds hope in Christ who ministers for them, that faith that believes in the second coming, that Christ will deliver them from the tribulations that are in this world. We have hope that when the world and the Babylon is fallen, there's going to be a generation of faithful people. Amen. Amen. Seraphim. I, I don't even know what to say because my brothers and sister have actually highlighted it. But just to say, to add on to what my sister has said, these people have two characteristics. At the end of the third angel's message, we are told about the characteristic of these people will stand for God in the last days. Mm. They are patient and they not only have the faith of 
but the faith, they, ha, they not only have faith in Jesus Christ, but they have the faith of Jesus Christ. We are told that the devil will come down with great wrath. Mm. Why? Because he knows he has but a very short time. To tell you, all these things will come to pass. And he knows he wants you to worship him. He wants you to join him against God. But we are told those who stand with God mm. will have patience. When wrath comes upon you, my brother, my sister, because of your faith and because of accepting the three angels' messages, have patience because these two shall come to pass and the ultimate goal is that you will be perfect in Christ Jesus mm -hmm. and you will inherit eternity in, in, with him. What a hope. Amen. Amen. It's been a wonderful study. The foundation of God's government. I'd love that we just give like one second <laughs> a rough up thought of the foundation of God's government. What is your takeaway from it, starting from you, Zafir? Uh, thank you so much. So for me, my takeaway is that the law of God is actually a gift. The law Amen. is good. It's, uh, the difficulty is that the fallen nature cannot keep God's law. Mm. But God has given us the gift of the Holy Spirit mm. freely. Mm. Insofar as we just ask, we shall receive that Amen. gift. And through that gift, um, uh, 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 God will enable us to keep the entirety of his law mm. fully. And yes, it may be uh, unpopular to other people, but we shall know that we shall be following on with God's way Amen. and doing God's will. Amen. And ultimately, when we're in heaven, it shall be even just a part of our nature, easily, no longer with the difficulties that we have today. Here. Mm. Uh -huh. Amen. Thank you, Zafet. Yes, yes. The law of God has not been changed. Mm -hmm. it's, it stands true. And as Japheth has said, the carnal man has enmity towards the law of God. Mm. Indeed, we cannot keep it. But what about the spiritual man? Uh, Paul says that we walk not in the flesh, but in the spirit. Amen. The carnal man may, be, may have enmity towards the law of God, but not the spiritual man. Therefore, mm. walk in the spirit. Allow the spirit of God to write his very law within, in, in, within your heart, and you will be able to keep it and glorify it. Amen. Amen. Seraphim, what is your takeaway thought? My takeaway mm. is at the end of it all. God, in the wake of all these controversies, will have a people who will stand for him. And the question I want to ask you, my brother, you, my sister, will you form the number of people who not only have the faith of Jesus Christ, but have the faith in him, which is able to enable you to stand? Will you form the number which will be patient amidst all odds, amidst all struggles, and will not faint? The question is, will you form the number? Mm. Thank you. I'd like to close the thoughts from uh, Revelation 18, uh, from verse 1 to 4. The Bible records, and I, after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. Babylon the great is fallen, and is become uh, the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Verse 3 says, for all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. In verse 4, he says, Now another voice now coming from heaven, saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. Verse 5 says, For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. So it tells us that all nations, so sometimes you may be wondering, could it just be these people that have this thing right? You look at the number of people who worship on the false Sabbath, and you wonder, for a fact, no, these people must be mistaken. Mm. A large number of people cannot be wrong. Mm. A large number of bishops, of pastors, of men and women with theology degrees who wrestle scripture, who understand Latin and Greek, all the wonderful languages which the Bible has written, those people cannot be wrong. The Bible says, all nations were drunk with the wine of the wrath. And God, speaking from heaven himself in verse 4, says, come out of her, my people. God's law 
can never change because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. And read, um, just read to us from the book of Isaiah, and we realize that it is, it's been Satan's aim, strategic, intentional aim, to just thwart the worship of God through undermining the law of God. It, he has been undermining the law of God all through from the beginning. Did God really tell you that you should not eat from this uh, tree? You know, those questions. And maybe he's asking you, uh, like, Jeff, like Onsongo is saying, how comes when all these people can be mistaken? Imagine, if you look at the number of people who worship on Sabbath, vis-a-vis -vis that of those who worship on Sunday, it's a huge difference. And you'd ask yourself, can all these people can be wrong? Yeah? That is the devil undermining the law of God. The Sabbath will remain. It doesn't matter what happens, who comes, who goes, what, who says. The Sabbath started in the beginning and it will remain so. Thank you so much for joining us. And we welcome you to continue with us in this journey. We are almost through, by the way. We are on lesson nine. And we thank God for this far. And at this moment, I'll ask that Seraphine, please close for us with a word of prayer. Shall we? Dear God, we thank you so much for the truths as ingrained in the word. Some of these truths are really trying and testing to the human nature. But I pray that we will be found true as we cling to the Lord of our salvation and from him get help. From him get strength. From him get patience. From him get courage to stand for that which is true and right. I pray that, dear God, as truths are impressed upon our hearts, we will not postpone obedience. God, today, if we hear your voice, let us not harden our hearts. God, I know you are faithful who has promised. You will also fulfill it. And this is our per perfection and our faith. Thank you because you have heard us and you will answer us. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.